All right, so welcome to um, welcome to an experimental lecture in STAT 512. Um, I decided to do things a little bit differently. Um, this is typically, I think, like the hardest lecture of the class. Um, and if you if you read the chapter in our textbook, which you're of course strongly encouraged to do, you'll you'll maybe get a little bit of a glimpse into that. Um, kind of why that is. It's it's a lecture that a lot of students tend to struggle with, um, primarily because I, I do it, it involves like a lot of hand calculation, so that's part of it. Um, the second part of it is um, the way our textbook does the hand calculations and the way SAS does the the calculations is different, and. I teach it, I, I made the decision to teach the method that SAS uses, since that's going to be, and not just SAS, I think most software packages. Um, our textbook, I like it, um, but this is kind of one of the things that it's a little idiosyncratic about. Um, and so that created, I think, a challenge for, for students, you know, for, for, for people like yourselves who are learning it for the first time, where, you know, it, it's just a challenging lecture, and so students go to the textbook for a little additional support, but then that textbook's actually doing it different than it was done in the lecture, and that just kind of creates like this sort of second layer of confusion. And I, I, I've always kind of gone back and forth and back and forth. I do think there's some value to, to knowing how these things are calculated, and that's why I do it. Um, but I have also observed over time that sometimes students get so bogged down in in the in the sort of calculations that I've noticed that they sometimes miss the big picture. Um, so there's a sacrifice, and it, it's not always been obvious to me that that trade-off um, is, is a is a worthwhile one. Um, but here we are, right? By um, by no ch no choice of our own, um, being forced into online education and. Um, at least in the classroom, when I do this, I, I can read faces. I can see where people are getting things. I can see where people are not getting things. I, I can, I can, I can make it work. I can, I can brute force us through through sheer power of will. Um, you know, through maybe one of the more challenging lectures in the class. Um, but I, I, I don't know that I have that ability as much as much as I would love to. Um, in this online environment. So so I made a decision. I made a decision to um, simplify this week's lecture, to de-emphasize calculations and, um, and extra emphasize um, the big picture. And we'll see how that goes. Um, you know, I, 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 I completely redid this lecture. It actually ended up being a bit on the shorter side. Um, so, so I apologize for that. For what it's worth, I actually probably put the most time into this lecture um, because I probably reduced the size of this thing by, by about half. Um, but I did it, I think, for your benefit, and I do think that ultimately you'll, you'll get in half this time the same, if not maybe a little bit more than you would from, from the larger lecture. Really all that's, that's sort of been removed is just a lot of calculations, hand calculations. I still encourage you to read the textbook and, and reading the textbook you'll still, I think, get a sense of these calculations and, and kind of how they work. Um, but, you know, I will not make them part of any type of assessment. You won't be required to do them, for example, on an impending exam. All right. Um, I definitely be interested in your feedback. So, you know, it, it's 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 hard lecturing to uh, to a wall, um, <laughs> which is which is what I've been doing. Um, and and for the most part part that's been okay because I've done these lectures before and I, I've done them enough times that you know I, I think I've streamlined them I can kind of anticipate which parts go smoothly which parts don't go smoothly and, and you know change that kind of stuff but you know in, in this example I can't see your faces so um, you know if you could shoot me an email and, and kind of let me know what you think whether you think this lecture um, was was comprehensible incomprehensible or or some uh, some bizarre blending of the two All right, let's limber up. Back to our much beloved uh, bear data set. Let's consider fitting a model where we look at the weight of a bear, that's our Y variable, 
as a linear function of its length, its chest girth, and its age. So three variables. We're building a multivariate regression model. NBD, no big deal. We learned how to do that. Uh, we learned how to do that last week. There's our code. Pretty straightforward, right? Proc reg for as in proc regression. Um, specify our data set. There's our model statement. The y variable goes on the left. We could put as many x variables as we would like on the right. There's our output. Um, at this point, we should be able to kind of understand what all those pieces of the output are. If, if, if we don't, um, you, should, you should reach out to me. Um, we have our ANOVA table up on the top, right? All, all of that kind of flows um, kind of from one piece to the other. The SSR is the top line. SSE is the middle line. SSY is the, is the bottom line. Our SSR has three degrees of freedom because there are three variables. Um, the degrees of freedom for the SSY is N minus one. Again, I think we saw something like this before. I think um, not all of the bears have ages. So even though our data set does have 99 bears, apparently only 57 bears, right, are such that we have, we have information in all four variables. Uh, the root MSE is just the square root of the MSE. The MSE, remember, is an estimate of the variance. Often the standard deviation is a more useful metric because that's in the original units of our problem. So, um, right, we have, we have an estimate for the standard deviation with that root MSE. Uh, the dependent mean, so that's the average weight for all bears. Coefficient of variation. Um, I forget off the top of my hand. Um, you could Google it. It's, it's a pretty straightforward descriptive statistic. It's a, it's a ratio of the mean to the variance or maybe the mean to the standard deviation. Um, but it, it's just a, it's just kind of it's comparing those two. It's a it's a ratio of center to spread. Um, the R squared we're familiar with. We'll talk what the adjusted R squared is um, in, a, in a few lectures. We have our model equation below, so, so we know what that is. We know how to use that for prediction. But last class, we said to kind of ignore those test statistics, the t-values, and ignore the p-values, right? Because we're, uh, we're not quite sure what they're doing yet, although we're going to learn this week what they are. So right now, what could we do? Well, we could look at the overall F-test. The overall F-test, right, is highly significant. It's got a p-value less than 0 0.0001, well, well, well below the usual uh, 0 0.05 threshold. That means that we would reject the null hypothesis, right? In this case, the null hypothesis is that beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3 all equal 0. That's the null hypothesis. Here we reject that null hypothesis. So rejecting that null hypothesis means that we think at least one of those slopes is something other than zero, right? At least one of those betas, maybe beta one, maybe beta two, maybe beta three, maybe two of them, maybe all of them are, are something other than zero, right? Put a little bit more straightforward. We think at least one of these variables, maybe more, is useful in the prediction of a bear's weight. And so what does that mean? It means that we want to dig deeper, right? It means that we want to be able to say, okay, at least one of these variables is useful. Which variable is it? How do we, how do we, how do we do this kind of extra exploratory phase? That's exactly what we're going to learn to do this week. So here we are. This is just review from last week. Our F statistic was 251.11. Um, it's got 3 and 53 degrees of freedom. Very, very uh, small p-value. So at least one of our variables is useful to us. Which ones is it? So one of the primary tools 
for answering this question, one of the primary tools for digging deeper, right? The statistician's shovel is the partial F test, which is what we use to do a test of a single variable. The test of a single variable tests whether or not a particular variable adds anything above and beyond. We'll, we'll elaborate on this um, in a few slides, but, but probably you have an intuitive sense of what this means already. Whether or not a particular variable adds anything above and beyond the other variables that are already in the model. The partial F test is a T test. Right, that is the test statistic follows a T distribution. Every T distribution has degrees of freedom. In this case, the degrees of freedom are the degrees of freedom for the MSE. Equivalently, right, this is an F test with one degree of freedom in the numerator and in, in the MSE um, degrees of freedom in the denominator. Remember, I think, yeah, I think it was just one lecture back. One lecture back, we made the observation that if you square a T statistic, right, you get an F statistic with that one degree of freedom in the numerator. So we have the sort of equivalence that still holds when talking about these partial F tests. The PROC reg output displays what is referred to as type 3 sum of squares. Essentially, what this is doing is it's testing whether or not each variable adds significantly to the prediction of y above and beyond what is already provided by all other variables in the model. Okay. So there's our output. Let's look at the parameter estimate section. First off, we have length. Very small. Well, we, we, first, what do we have? We have a parameter estimate. That's the 0.09. We have its standard error. We divide the parameter estimate by its standard error. 0.09 divided by 0.9 gives us about what? About 0.10. So the parameter estimate divided by its standard error still gives us our still gives us our t statistic. The t statistic in this case has 53 degrees of freedom. That's the degrees of freedom for our MSE. And a very large p value, right? 0 0.9170. What is that saying? It's saying that length does not add anything above and beyond chest and age, the other the other variables that are in our model. Next is the chest line. The chest p-value is very small, less than 0 0.0001. So, so what? So that's saying that chest does add significantly above and beyond what's already being provided by length and age. It's a useful addition to our model even if our model already has length and age, it improves that model. The third variable, age, has a p-value of 0.0147, still below the usual 0.05 threshold, the usual 0.05 significance level. So we reject the null hypothesis. We think that the, the coefficient, the slope coefficient, that parameter estimate for age is something other than zero in, in a model equation that ha has all three variables. And so that means that we think age adds something above and beyond length and chest. Right? So what's our conclusion, right? We, we, we started with that overall F test. The overall F test told us what? The overall F test said, right, at least one of these variables is useful. Which one or ones do we think it is? It appears that it might be chest and age. At the very least, right, we could see that length is not useful or not necessary. So what the next step should be what the next step should be 
is we should remove length from our model and rerun the model. And then we look at the p-values for chest and age. They can, well, they will change, often not by a lot. And usually if they're significant, they will stay significant. But it is possible that maybe they go from, from being significant to non-significant. And, and then we would end up removing one of them as well. So it's not quite as simple as just removing length and being done. We have to remove length and rerun it and then double check the p-values for chest and age. We'll, we'll elaborate on all of this um, in, in, in the slides coming up. Okay. Again, I really encourage you to print the PowerPoints before listening to the lectures because the slides that are coming after this are going to be referring back to this output. So it would be nice for you to be able to kind of pause the video and then look at this, uh, at this output. All right, so I'm actually, I have a slide for each of those three variables. I already said this, but right here it is in writing. That, that line in the parameter estimate section dedicated to the variable length, what's going on there? Well, we're asking, does the length of a bear add anything above and beyond chest girth and age in the prediction of a bear's weight? There's the t-statistic, it's degrees of freedom and it's p-value. At the 0.05 significance level, right, that p-value is so large that we fail to reject the null hypothesis. There is not enough evidence to conclude that the length of a bear adds any usefulness above and beyond chest girth and age for predicting the weight of a bear. And then here's chest. The line for chest is saying, does chest girth add anything above and beyond length and age? The small p-value says, yes, it does. And then age, does the age of a bear add anything above and beyond length and chest girth in the prediction of a bear's weight? Again, it has a somewhat small p-value. <laughs> We've been spoiled, right? We have, we have all these immeasurably small ones that that actually kind of feels a little bit large, but it's still well below 0.05. So that indicates that age is useful above and beyond its peers, right? Above and beyond length and chest. So what, right? At the end of the day, right, we're not gathering information just for the sake of gathering information, right? We're not jumping through hoops to become better hoop jumpers, right? We're gathering the information always with a goal. Our goal in this case is to build the best possible model. So how do these tests lead us to that best possible model? What is the, the, the action suggested by what we've just what we've just looked at the action is that we should remove length from the model and rerun the model this approach this algorithm is referred to as a type 3 approach to model building The type three method, the type three approach to model building works like this, right? You start with your largest model, you're gonna whittle it down. Again, I often call this like a destructive process. You're starting with the largest model, probably a bloated model, probably a model that has too many variables in there. We wanna trim it down. We wanna get it into fighting form. So we're going to have to we're going to have to trim the fat. We're going to have to remove the excess. So how do we do that? Well, we look for the variable that has the largest p-value. That means that's the variable that's contributing the least above and beyond its peers. If its p-value is more than 0.05, bye Felicia, see you later. Right? We take it right out of the model. Then we rerun the model. We look at all the remaining variables, which one has the largest p-value. If it's more than 0.05, we remove it and rerun it. And we keep repeating this process until all of the variables in our model have, have a sort of type 3 p-value that's below 
right, our, our threshold, I, I'm being general in the slide, but often, usually, that threshold is 0.05. So, right, well, we would continue until all the remaining variables have a p-value less than 0.05. Now, the type 3 approach is not the only approach. Another approach is something referred to as a type 1 sum of squares. A type 1 sum of squares is referred to as a sequential sum of squares. It tests each variable as if they are being added to the model one at a time, i.e. sequentially. Which implies what? It implies that the order that we put our variables in the model statement matters. Normally, in a lot of cases, it doesn't matter. But in terms of the type 1 sums of squares, it does. Now, type 1 sum of squares is not part of the default output in proc reg. Nonetheless, we can ask procreg to provide it for us by typing slash ss1, right? Type 1 sum of squares at the end of the model statement. Alternatively, we could use another proc called proc GLM, general linear model. That's what GLM stands for. And the type 1 sum of squares is part of the default output for PROC GLM. Okay. So in this class, we'll go back and forth between PROC REG and PROC GLM. They're very, very similar. I don't know, 80%, 90% the same? <laughs> Um, I think that historically speaking, proc reg might be the older proc, and so GLM might be the newer proc, and so, right, as something a little bit newer might have some kind of kind of more bells and whistles associated with it, slightly more updated procedure. Um, proc reg is is very specific to regression, so it has certain options that are very regression specific that GLM does not have. GLM is more general. Um, but we'll see that that generality comes with kind of like some some better functionality. It's good to be familiar with both. I'll, I'll kind of try to highlight when one of them's doing something that the other doesn't. Okay. Right now, what we're seeing is that GLM gives us the type one sums of squares a little bit more easily than Proc Reg does, and that's why that's why I'm segueing to it right now. The syntax is very, very, very similar, right? In fact, I mean, that's essentially like the same output from before. It's just I deleted reg and replaced it with GLM. I think everything else is the same, right? Now notice, for the type one sum of squares, the order of those variables matters. So I wrote it as first length, then chest, then age. That does not change the type 3 sums of squares, right? If I did chest age length, the type 3 sums of squares would all stay the same, but the type 1s would change. I encourage you, you have the bare data set, I encourage you to, to verify this yourself, right? Listening to me lecture only gets you so far. Half the way? I like to think more than half the way, but not all of the way, right? Only you can push yourself over that finish line. So, right, statistics is a hands-on discipline. You learn by doing much more than by listening. So I encourage you to actually pull that bear's data set up. Try jumbling around those orders. See what happens to your output. So here's the GLM output. Looks pretty similar to the PROC reg output, doesn't it? We got the ANOVA table up on the top. It's the same ANOVA table we had from PROC reg. 
we have the parameter estimates way on the bottom. Same parameter estimates, same T statistics, same P values. Now in the middle, we have two new things. We have a we have a two sets of the variables, right? And we can see one of them has a type one sum of squares column. One of them has a type three sum of squares column. Let's start with the type three sum of squares column. Notice that the type three sum of squares section, the p values there match the p values from the parameter estimates, right? That's what I said. I said the parameter estimates are type three p values. So it should not be surprising to us that the p values are the same. Now, strangely, the test statistics are different. What the cut the? How can the how can the p values be the same but the test statistics be different? Well, it's because we're looking at like a different scale, right? SAS is reporting the parameter estimates using a t statistic. It's reporting the the type three uh, test statistics as an f statistic, right? And remember, if you square a t, you get an f. So, right? We, our T statistic for length is 0 0.10. If you square 0 0.10, you get 0 0.01. That's our test statistic for the F. Our test statistic for chest is a little bit more than 10. You square a number that's a little bit more than 10, then you get 114, right? A number that's a little bit more than 100. Right? So again, I encourage you, do it. Pull out your calculator. Open a browser in, in Google. Square each of those numbers, 0.1 squared, 10.7 squared, 2.52 squared. See for yourself that those that those calculations do, in fact, give you the numbers that SAS is reporting for the F statistics. Now, let's look at the type 1 sum of squares. Okay? Don't feel like you need to necessarily write this down. Everything I'm going to say is written in the next few slides. I'm just going to initially say it now because the, the numbers are conveniently in front of us. What's being tested? Remember, this is being tested sequentially. So length comes first. Notice in this case, length is highly significant. What is that basically saying? Since length is being added first, it's basically testing whether or not length is better than nothing at all. It's essentially it's essentially doing simple it's doing a, a, a simple linear regression model. Is length significant in a simple linear regression model? Which is essentially saying is length better than nothing at all in the prediction of a bear's weight? And and the answer is hell yeah it is, right? It, it, compared to nothing, length is adding a lot. It's highly significant. Then comes chest. That second line is now saying, does chest add anything above and beyond length? Does chest add anything above and beyond length? And the answer in this case is, yeah, it does, right? It's it's highly significant. And so it's saying that we think it's coefficient is something other than zero in a model that has those two variables in it. And then, right, comes age. So now we've worked our way up to a three variable model. That's what we're, that's what we're looking at now. We have a three variable model. In this three variable model, is, is the coefficient for age zero or non-zero? Is that variable age significant or non-significant? And in this case, in this case, it is significant. Now, concept check. This hopefully is not surprising. Notice that the p-value for age in the type one section is the same as the p-value for age in the type three section. That should make sense to you. If it makes sense to you, you're in a great shape. If it does not make sense to you, do not settle for that ignorance. Go back, 
watch the videos, listen to what I've said, perhaps read the textbook. And if it's still not, not clicking, then reach out to me and or one of our graduate assistants, right? That is, that is something, it's a nice intuitive check for us. Whichever variable comes last in our in our in our type one sequence is going to have the same is going to have the same line as as it does in the type three section. Okay. Now I will say this, right? It looks as if chest it, chest might have the same p value. It does not. They're both very, very small, but if we measured them precisely, the p-value for the type 1 chest and the p-value for the type 3 chest would be different. The only ones that are guaranteed to be identical are, are the last variable, in this case, age. Now, let's actually look at the type 1 sum of squares. Okay? If we go to the ANOVA table... What's our SSR? Our ANOVA table, our ANOVA table for the SSR is 765,000, right? That's a measurement of the variability explained by our regression model. We can see the R squared is 0.93, so, right? 765,000 out of 819,000. That's 0.93. So our, our, our overall model, these three variables, these three variables explain 93% of the variability in a bear's weight. Now, what's cool about the type 1 sums of squares is that they decompose that's 765,000, right? So those three variables explain 765,000 of the total variation. And we can allocate, right? We could sort of break up of that 765,000 how much goes to each variable. That's what's being done in the type 1 sum of squares. So if you look at the type 1 sum of squares for length, it's basically saying that that type 1 sum of squares is 617,783. Okay? So a lot of it's attributable to length. That's basically that type 1 sum of squares. Again, I encourage you to run this yourself. Get that bare data set. Run a proc reg that only has length in the model, and you will see the SSR for that model is 617,000. Then, what's that 141,000 saying? It's saying that if we add chest to that model, so now you're running proc reg with just length and chest in your model. If you do that, your SSR increases by 141,000. So that would go up to about what? It would go up to about um, 700 and, now 760,000, 759,000. So that SS, that, that SS1 is basically the, the, the incremental increase in the sums of squares and in the in the sum of square regression due to the variable chest All right you could also do of course 141,000 divided by 819,000 and you could see that what that means is adding that variable increases the r squared by a certain percent in this case, we're saying by a significant percent, right? We're basically saying the amount of sum of squares added to the to the SSR when we add chest to our model is significant. Now, that third line age is basically saying if we now add a third variable age, the sum of squares regression only increases by 6,000, which is not a lot. But in this case, is does register as a significant amount. Okay. So that type one, that type one sum of squares is actually like a nice number.
it's basically showing us, right, so length is what the SSR is for that one variable model, and then as we're adding variables one at a time, the, the continued the continued type one sum of squares is how much sum of squares is being added to the SSR as we're adding more and more variables into our model. So again, get a calculator out. Seven, 617,000 plus 141,000 plus 6,457, boom. That's gonna give you 765,279.8593. Math fact. It is not true that the type three sums of squares will add up. So that's a nice property that the type one sums of squares have that the type three doesn't. Now, I'm gonna summarize all this in, in some upcoming slides, but one last thing for us to think about, one last thing for us to think about What, what do we mean when we say something significant above and beyond another variable? Well, this data set, I think, kind of illustrates that idea pretty nicely, right? Like, we want to predict the weight of a bear. And we kind of have two variables that we actually might think of as being pretty similar. We could run proc core on them, and I'm sure we would see that they're highly correlated. And that is length and chest, right? In some ways, they might be redundant, right? Or they might be doing the same thing, right? The, the length of the bear or the circumference of its chest are both kind of doing what? They're, they're both kind of measurements of like the, the, the more abstract idea of the, the size of the bear, right? They're almost like two, two ways of measuring the same concept. And it, it, it certainly is possible that we don't need both of those, that, that either one of them is good, but maybe both of them together creates a redundancy. Does that make sense? And in fact, that is what we're seeing in this, in this particular example, isn't it? We're seeing that, yeah, length is highly significant. The size of a bear is a, a, an incredibly important factor in predicting the weight of the bear. That makes sense biologically. Length is better than nothing. But what, but what we see when we look at the type 3 sums of squares is that length is highly non-significant in the presence of chest and age, but I suspect it's really chest that's, that's, that's doing most of the work in making length redundant. Right? Length is, is, is by itself an important measurement of size, but it turns out it looks like that perhaps chest measures this concept of size better than length does. And if we have a model that already has chest, well, now length is redundant. Now length is no, lad, no longer adding anything. It's just creating an unnecessarily complex model. So let's trim the fat. Does that make sense? Some, something for us to think about. A lot of big ideas in this week's lecture. This is just kind of, I think the next quite a few slides are just kind of going over things I already said. So it's written down for those of you that are kind of more visual learners, um, you know, relative to those of you that are that are more auditory. So so this is this is the type one line. And, and what is each of those things saying? Since length came first, we're saying, does the length of a bear help in the prediction of, of a bear's weight? Right, the T was 608. Um, it has 53 degrees of freedom. Its p-value is um, less than 0 0.0001. So at the at the 0 0.05 significance level, right, we reject. There is very strong evidence that the length of a bear significantly helps in the prediction of its weight. Right? Does the chest girth of a bear add anything above and beyond um, length? Well, our F statistic is 138. Right? One degree of freedom in the numerator, 53 degrees of freedom in the denominator. 
p-value less than 0.001. So yes, chest does add um, above and beyond length. Right? Chest as a measurement of size, right, does have something is is maybe in some way better than length, or at least is providing something that length is not. And then finally, age, right? Is age significant above and beyond the other two variables? And again, right, we've already seen that the answer to this is yes. Okay. And then this was the concept check that we had before. The type one sum of squares and its F test for the last ordered variable will always be the same as its type three sum of squares. That should hopefully make sense. If not, do what I said. Take those three variables. We did length, chest, and age. Do chest, length, then age. Then do age, chest, and length, right? I, I could do it myself. I could. I could, have, I could have embedded it in the PowerPoint. I considered doing it. But again, I'm a believer. I'm a believer that you're going to learn by doing it yourself. My job is to empower you to do it yourself, right? I've shown you I've shown you one way to do it, and and hopefully, based off the however many slides we've just gone through, that's enough for you to do the next step on your own and the next step on your own, and, and that's where the learning is really going to happen. Okay? Now, a quick discussion of type one versus type three. Type one and type three give two conceptually different methods for building models. The type one method is, is like a constructive approach. You start with with nothing, and you kind of build the model upwards, right? You're 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 constructing a model. You put the best variable in first, and then the second best variable, and then the third best variable, and the fourth best variable, and you do this you do this very purposefully. The length, chest, age order I did was just for pedagogical purposes. It was just a random, arbitrary ordering. That's not really the way that you would want to do a type one method. A type one method, you want to have a very specific order. And the specific order that we would use for a type one method to model building is this. We find the variable that explains the most variability of y. We could do that with proc core. Let's call that variable x sub i. We then find the variable that explains the greatest amount of the remaining variability of and y given x, and then we add that. Now we have an xi, xj. And then we look, right, okay, so of all remaining variables, which one adds the most above and beyond the two variables that are in my model? Put that in my model. Then of all the remaining variables, which one adds the most above and beyond the three variables that are in my model? Add that variable. And keep doing that until none of the remaining variables are adding anything significant to your model. Then you're done. Right? It's the type one method of model building. And then here's the type three method, which I already kind of already kind of insinuated. Right? That is this kind of like destructive approach. You start with the largest possible model. And, and you remove the bad variables one at a time, right? The type one, you're adding good variables one at a time until there's no more good variables to add. The type three method, you start with everything, you remove the bad variables one at a time until there's no more bad variables to remove. Now, for what it's worth, I am not considering this concept completely taught. This is this is a this is an exposure. The 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 main point of this lecture is just the partial F test and kind of understanding what it is and how it works. Now I, I do think that that providing a little context around that helps us understand it, and that's why I'm I'm exposing us now to this idea of type one and type three, and how they tie into different ways of building models. 
but this is an idea that we're going to return to multiple times throughout the semester and we'll keep building on it and we'll keep building on it so hopefully you have like a like a sense of what's going on but if, if, if there's still like some unanswered questions that's fine we'll, we'll we'll answer those as the semester goes on I promise all right um, we're actually we're getting pretty close to the end of this video um, but it, we are at a good breaking point as well. We've kind of wrapped up this idea of partial F test. That's behind us. So if you want to give yourself a break, certainly feel free. We're getting ready to kind of start this one last um, related but also distinct um, section that's going to kind of wrap things up. And that's called the multiple F test. Um, so we have the overall F test. That's what that ANOVA table does. We have the partial F tests, right? Those are tests of a single variable above and beyond all the other variables in a model and this multiple F test the partial F test is going to be like a special case of this multiple F test the multiple F test is I, th I think also called um, maybe by a textbook I'm not, I'm not quite sure where this uh, this word chunk wise came from um, but but I don't think I made it up out of thin air um, it's, it's also called a chunk wise test or, or test of chunk wise addition you're adding a chunk Of variables to your model right so so the multiple F test is like a generalized partial F test instead of adding one variable we're adding a collection a subset of K variables right to uh, to a pre-existing model in fact you can even think of the overall F test as like as like a special case of the chunk wise test right that the, the overall F test is we're adding a chunk of K variables to like an empty model That's what the overall F test is and the partial F test is what the partial F test is we're adding a chunk of size 1 so K equals 1 to some pre-existing model and we're asking ourselves do these variables these k variables considered jointly have a significant effect in predicting y above and beyond what's already in the model and this test has an f statistic with k degrees of freedom in the numerator and and the MSE degrees of freedom of the denominator and, and that's the MSE of the model that has all your variables right including including your chunk so for example what if we wanted to see if the squared and cubed terms for age contribute anything above and beyond the other variables to our model now I know we haven't formally discussed polynomials we will we're gonna have an entire lecture or at least part of an entire lecture um, devoted to to the sort of special considerations of adding polynomial terms but I think most of us should be comfortable with the idea of okay if there's an X what about an X squared if there's an X squared what about an X cubed and so that's what we're doing here we sometimes call these things like higher order terms they kind of add like an extra layer of complexity above and beyond our base order terms and so kind of what this chunkwise test is doing in this case is it is it saying right do I need this extra level of complexity do I need higher order terms yes or no and of course I, I'm a little bit arbitrary singling out age we could just as easily put a squared term and a cubed term for length and a squared term and a cubed term for chest and now we have a chunk of size six right there's nothing wrong with doing that in fact that's probably a better approach I just tried to keep this first example somewhat simple right since it's our our first exposure so here we are um, we have to unfortunately create these uh, these polynomial terms in a data step so that should shouldn't be that big a deal for us right SAS has this kind of I think it's kind of quirky notation for for exponentiation where it uses asterisk asterisk instead of the caret sign 
So, so we have age underscore two is going to be our age squared variable. Age underscore three is going to be our age cubed variable. And so what do I do? So I, I, I run my proc and I run it with everything. All variables, including the variables in my chunk, right? This example has a chunk of size what? Exactly. It's a chunk of size two. K equals two. Now we can do, we can do the chunkwise test with the test statement. Now this is an example of something that I that we can well, we can definitely do it in proc reg as we're going to see. I don't believe we can do it in proc glm. So this is a nice function that proc reg has that glm does not. So we've seen glm has easy access to type one sum of squares, but proc reg has this nice test statement, which is which is pretty nice or pretty convenient for doing these chunkwise tests. So here in the test, I just, I just, I list all the variables that are in my chunk and separate them by commas. Okay. And so here we are, right? So here's our output. Um, there's our model parameter estimates and everything else. Notice that now our degrees of freedom for the SSR is five because we have five variables in our model, All right? That makes the MSE smaller. Now our MSE is 51 instead of 53. All right, so our chunkwise test is gonna be an S statistic with two degrees of freedom in the numerator because that's the size of our chunk and 51 degrees of freedom in the denominator. It's always the degrees of freedom of the MSE. Now to get the actual test, I have to scroll through my output to a second page of output. And here it is, right? And actually, look at that. SAS conveniently lists the degrees of freedom for us, builds a kind of smaller version of an ANOVA table, gives us the F statistic, And then gives us the p-value, 0.1609. Pretty cool, right? So what's our conclusion? Well, that's 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 more than the usual 0.05 cutoff. So we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. So we would basically say, right, none of the variables in our chunk, in this case, neither age squared nor age cubed, add anything above and beyond the terms already in our model, above and beyond length and chest and age. Yeah, our test statistics 1.89. It's an F statistic. Uh, the P value is 0 0.1609, which is more than 0 0.05. So we failed to reject the null hypothesis. Now, a, a sort of natural question um, that, that you may or may not be harboring is well, why, why do we care about chunkwise tests? Why is this an important sort of tool in our, in our um, ever-growing statistician's toolbox? Well, it's a good question, right? Because we could what? I mean, we could just, instead of doing a ch like one test for like k variables, just do k tests right for example we could have tested just age squared and then tested just age cubed we could have done it as two tests with the partial f test why do i need this whole other type of test well just something to think about this is an idea that we're going to elaborate on in much greater detail down the road but something to think about this is this is true for like for all of statistics. It's not just not just this context, not just regression, not just model building. The more tests that we do, the more likely we are to make a type one error. Does that make sense? So here we gotta be a little careful. Statistics statistics uh, recycles that term type one. So we have this type one approach to model building, adding one variable at a time. We also have a type one error unrelated terms it's confusing i know 
What's a type 1 error? Type 1 error is rejecting the null hypothesis when we should not have rejected the null hypothesis, concluding that something is significant when in fact it is not significant. If we use an alpha of 0.05 on any one test, that means that for that particular test, we have a 5% chance of doing a type 1 error, right? But again, 5% is what? It's 1 in 20. So that means what? It means that if we did 20 tests, we would almost expect to have made a type 1 error somewhere along the line. Agreed? And if we did 40 tests, we would expect to have made two errors and so on. So the idea is the more tests that we do, the more likely it is that we're going to make an error. And with that in mind, we should hopefully see that it's always in our best interest to do as few tests as possible. And the chunkwise test is a tool that allows us to accomplish that goal. Now again, implementing that tool artistically, that's something that we're gonna develop. We're gonna develop it over time. So don't necessarily worry if you're not quite sure how to put it to best use. This week, I just wanna make you aware of its existence and how to go about using it right through that test statement. And that wraps up this week's lecture. I really, really, really would be interested in your feedback, positive or negative. It's fine, right? It's I'm, I'm a big boy. You can you can bring it on. If you didn't like it, you didn't like it. If you felt like there were things that were left out, let me know. Right? This lecture, more than any of the lectures, I, I really it, it's it's almost like a freshly built lecture. I had something. I completely I, I gave it the type three treatment. I just I just completely destroyed it. And then, and then I did the type one treatment. I just kind of built this new lecture like, essentially out of just that wreckage. So um, hopefully it flowed good. It, it felt it felt like it flowed pretty good as I was lecturing it. Um, but you know, sometimes sometimes I, I can overlook um, maybe where something didn't flow or something didn't connect or just something just didn't make sense. So um, either good or bad, please please shoot me an email. I would appreciate it and kind of let me know. Um, whether this lecture made sense to you or not. Of course, you know, also supplement it with the lab and, and everything else. Um, but again, let me let me know what you think. And then I'll, uh, I'll see you next week for uh, for kind of our wind down lecture before our, yeah, it's coming up soon, before our first exam.